Hi, I'm Carol, and uh, I'll be moderating this panel and also posing questions from the audience. Do put them on Slido. We're just waiting for the final member to come and join us, but we can start already with um, maybe Luke. You want to introduce your company and who you are? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, my name is Luke, Luke Streijers, uh, Dutch name. I work for Dairybit. Um, and personally, I look after all things commercially. So that's clients, products, uh, partnerships, external relations, stuff like that. Um, we are uh, particularly known for our options market. Uh, we are the biggest in the option space, but all for trading in uh, perpetual swaps and futures as well. And we are, um, let's say, one of the top 10 derivatives platforms out there. Lovely. OK, Andy. Uh, I'm Andy Krogan. I work at FTX. Uh, I handle a good amount of the operations there, which includes things like compliance, risk management, uh, business development, and uh, just overall management of the team. So FTX is a uh, Sorry. is a uh, you know derivatives exchange in crypto, specifically focusing on derivatives. Uh, we do have some spot markets, but it's not our main focus. Uh, things like cash settled, uh, cash being stablecoin settled futures and perpetual swaps. Um, so this allows for you know the equivalent of in traditional finance. There's both cash and physically settled futures, and we're focusing specifically on the cash settled side. Thank you, Andy. Lennox. Yeah, uh, my name is Lennox. Uh, I'm the director of financial market at OKX. I've been OKX for three years. I've been uh, working for OKX product and tech sign. Right now, we really focus on institutional and international developments. So my background is also a quant trader, trading CME and Chinese futures before. I uh, actively engage in product developments and derivative space in OKX. Great, okay, and I'm Carol Alexander from the University of Sussex, um, and you can find out more about me if you want to on the web. This is just to remind me what we're talking about um, and give a bit of focus to the discussion. You can see where we're going um, from this particular um, snapshot of a spoofing order on uh, BitMEX, which uh, created uh, quite a big decline from, uh, thank you, uh, on the BitMEX Perpetual from 7400 down to below 7000. Um, and uh, I don't just want to talk about um, manipulation and so forth in, uh, in perpetuals and futures. First of all, I'd like to talk mainly to Lennox, who's got the largest mar um, market. I mean, the average daily volume on the OKEX mm. perpetuals and futures together is about um, 3 billion USD. Yep. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your customers, your um, margin arrangements, how, how you're um, building this market going forward? Cool. Uh, yeah, sure. Our majority client base is still APEC user. Yeah, I think around uh, at least 80% uh, of retail client base are actually APEC user, uh, majorly Korean, Chinese, uh, Singaporean. So, but in terms of volume, I think half-half, uh, APEC user and uh, the Western side. And uh, what about the balance between retail and institutional? Are oh, uh, actually 99%. 99%? A retail user, only 1% are institutional. Uh, institutional. Mm -hmm. But the inst that particular 1% actually contributes around 70% of OKX volume. Right. Yeah. Okay, and um, how about your leverage and margining? How does that work on these, these products? Yeah, uh, so basically on leverage, we support 100 times leverage. But in terms of margin, we, we, have, a posi we have tiered position margin uh, system mechanism. So basically, if you want to do 100 times leverage, we only allow you open for 2,000 contracts. So if the con mm -hmm. yeah, so so basically, if your contract, if the number of contract increase, uh, y your effective leverage has to be. So it's a hundred times leverage the yeah. maximum and two thousand contracts. Yeah, yeah. How big are the contracts on the and futures and perpetuals? On Bitcoin, it's on hundred hundred USD. Okay. Uh, no signal value. On the other contracts, ten USD. Mm -hmm. uh, no signal value. And you also have um, tether-based uh, products. Yes. Yeah, so basically in OKEX, we support um, token base, which is uh, using the particular token as an underlying of the futures. So you can go to inverse type of futures and swap. 
And we, we also have a tether-based uh, linear products, also future sense one. OK. No. So I suppose it's not nearly as big as the Binance USD. US, you, do bit, you do Bitcoin tether, not USD tether. No, the no, Bitcoin no, tether. no. And that, what's the volume like on that? I think uh, right now, to be frank, uh, most of the volume are token-based futures and swap. So I think it's around, if you compare with the tether base, I think tether base is only 15% of the, of compare with the token-based futures. Yeah, 15% okay, so volume. I think it's picking up, but uh, most in crypto, normally, uh, people get used to the token-based futures already. So you think tethers? T tether products are becoming more and more I think popular. It's picking up. More I think it's picking up. Tether gets issued. We had another half a billion issued in one lot about uh, three weeks ago. Yep. Interesting. I wonder whether that's. Uh, anyway. Yes. Um, so um, now back to Andy. Mm -hmm. um, hi. I was very interested. Uh, we haven't met before, so I'm um, nice very interested you. to look at the array of products that you're um, that you're offering. But let's just focus on the perpetuals and futures. Mm -hmm. um, are they just hedging instruments? Are, you, are they there for speculation? What's the main demand? And what do you, what's your margining? And, uh, so so right now, you know, like oh, most of us up here probably have perpetuals and futures being the largest portion of all of our products. The futures um, is the largest. Uh, for FTX in particular, it's perpetual swaps. But yes, I mean, yes. we offer an array of products like the leverage tokens and prediction markets. But... In reality, you know, the futures and the swaps end up being a majority of the yes. of, of the volume. And um, I was talking to Lennox earlier. Most of the liquidity really is around the quarterly futures. Same yeah. for you, yeah. But you might. Uh, not yeah, you know, around the quarterly futures, um, and and yeah, and the perpetual swaps is our, is our most liquid market. Earlier on, I was talking about the need to have some really good fee structures so that um, maker fees are. Um, only rebated, uh, you know, in very small amounts or for rewarding high volumes. And um, I asked my guys to have a look at your fees, and we couldn't see any maker rebates. Is that right? Oh yeah, we don't provide maker rebates. Um, no maker rebates. No maker rebates. Not even um, under the counter. <laughs> <laughs> no. So honestly, it's really just what's really important is the spread between the maker and taker. Okay. Um, and you get a, you get some weird functions that that occur when you offer rebates. Yeah, um, like washing. So, pardon? Like washing. Yeah, so it gets to be in a, it gets into an odd an odd spot. So we just kind of decided early on that we weren't gonna we weren't gonna go that direction. Okay. Yeah. So you know the we offer somewhere at the highest tier somewhere between seven bips between maker taker. Seven bips. Yeah. Um, and what about uh, you, Lennox? How does that compare? We offer maker rebates. Uh, the demand of rebates is actually contributes to the volume. So the more volume you drive and you trade, uh, the better rebates that yeah. you get. So uh, it's more like a tier fee system. Uh, if you want better rebate, you have to trade more. Yeah, yeah. And, and then yours, your futures, which are much lower volumes, they're, they're two books, are they, for everything? On the maker um, side, if you look at our futures, the volume is linked to our options yes. uh, activity. So it's not on the one-on-one basis. But let's say, like yesterday, if we round down, we trade a billion approximately, out of which is 200 million options, um, 200 million futures, and 600 million perpetual swaps, something like that. Okay. So for the options side, we have different fees. For futures and perpetual swaps, we have the same fees. So for us, it's um, uh, minus 2.5 rebate. Mm. So everyone has the same rebate, and we only mm. reduce taker fees. So um, the rates go. So the, the starting rates, if you subscribe via the website, no affiliations and stuff like that, you pay seven and a half. But most people pay somewhere between five and four. Mm. So if you pay four versus two and a half, it's one and a half uh, base point spread. Right. I mean, the reason I'm asking about the, this fee structure is that, I mean, the, the perpetual swap, the BitMEX came in around 2017. It seemed like it's completely cornered the market, still got much the largest volume, but then everybody else started piling in, mainly last year. You know, Huobi came in uh, with, uh, with futures and so forth in uh, only very, very recently, July last year. But what is it that's going to be making the customers go to your exchange rather than any other new exchange that started to launch futures and perpetuals in exactly the, you know, exactly the same products? Any of you? What, what, what's your selling points? For us, it's, for us, it's easy. So the perpetual product, even though it's 60% of our volumes and therefore it pays the bills, 
uh, it's a byproduct, uh, but people come to us um, for our options. So options is what yeah. makes us unique. We have uh, 80, 90 percent of the market. So a year ago we were the only one, and now there's multiple platforms launching, uh, which is good because uh, together we drive the volume, and we each chip in in educating and etc. Um, but it, what makes the option growth possible is development. So we have, mm -hmm. for example, portfolio margining system where we look at the full portfolio instead of a single position. Uh, so if you have multiple options, outstanding, plus futures, etc., we all look at that together and then okay. margin. So you have quite advanced. So stuff like that, we're doing Pretty bulk orders, okay. market make protection. It's all, it requires a lot of development, mm -hmm. which is uh, expensed essentially by uh, the people trading the swaps in the futures, which is more like an arbitrage product. Yeah. And it tracks retail. So a lot of retail is interested in perpetual trading. What about you two? What makes your exchange the one to go to for perps and futures? Uh, I think uh, I think the selling point of OKX should be so we ha we are, we have basically everything so spot margin futures and so it's the, it's the variety of products that you yeah order. so the diversity of, so uh, on on OKX alone or uh, you can basically run all kind of different kind of strategies are mm -hmm. uh, on OKX alone without without transferring your fund to the other spot exchanges. So, for example, one of the very common strategies on OKX across uh, is called index arbitrage strategies. So, holding spot and futures, hedge futures and spot at the same time, uh, or some of that. Another common type of strategies is uh, the fu the futures and swap uh, absolute up. So, in between both sides. So, these are the thing or very strategies that's very common. Uh, traders love it, and you can e execute uh, kind of like referring on their case. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we're going to be moving on to options in a minute, but um, there's more manipulation going on in futures than in options, and I'm just wondering about your um, warning systems for spoofing, pinging, wash. Obviously, washing is fairly easy, and your fee structure doesn't encourage it. Yeah. Um, but what about spoofing? such as that, or pinging, you know, testing the market liquidity and that. Have you got some sophisticated techniques to prevent that happening? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, to be frank, on a universal level, so the spoofing activities actually harm the true liquidity of the order book. Yeah, so, so we put, a, we put an internal proprietary warning system. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, we can call it a post-trade monitoring more. So we identify the person, because 99% of the user Right now, and okay, it's already KYC. Uh, so we are ninety-nine percent of your users yeah, have yeah, KYC. Yeah. It's already finished the KYC. Okay. So we got their names, we got their ID, we got their address, we got their uh, the corporate documents. Yeah. Okay. So we are pro we so are if able. If you see a spoofing order, you're going to call them up and say, "Hey, what you're doing?" Yeah. So we okay. not just spoofing, but uh, different kind of market manipulating behavior. Yeah, yeah. So for example, somebody wanted to bypass their uh, the tier position margin system, so they open a bunch of must account, a personal account, personal. That's Personal, personal account, accounts. individual they have account, individual many account. accounts. Yes. So it's a, but actually the underlying strategies yep. is actually belongs to the same algo, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so uh, we are monitoring that. So okay. if, if you are going through the same exactly same IP, opening the right. exactly same position, exactly same liquidation price, we will trigger our warning internal warning system. Excellent. This yeah, is good so to there's know. a lot of thing we need to do. On okay. The, uh, we need to. Uh, KYC is part of the ingredient of risk management. Accounted is be an abrasive behavior, uh, but we mostly right now done on post trade basis. Our compliance have internal program check every single time. Well, that's obviously a model for all futures exchanges. Yep. Right, let's move to options. Um, so Deribit is the main options yeah, provider. Yeah, yeah. Ledger X seem to have um, faded into insignificance. Mm -hmm. This is just a picture that one of my guys drew from uh, your, your scraping your data yesterday, Luke, at 12 o'clock. So this is the implied vol surface going up to deep out of the money puts uh, above 80%. I'm sure it's going to go more um, if the uh, sell-off continues. Uh, and the the obvious skew, and then the what I call the 10% out of the money put call ratio. So we, we exclude out the money, and you can see now the liquidity. This is the volume of puts to calls, and it's gone right down um, the last couple of weeks. Very, very little, li um, little liquidity in your book if you go um, out of 10% of, of out the money, whereas normally, you know, it's, it's well, well above one. Of course, it's a bit variable. So this means that 
if you are looking at um, any strategies like your strategies where you're, you're introducing volatility products, which may be based on VIX type formulae, and you have to take a static hedge, which involves extra weighting on the deep out of the money puts, you're going to be stumped. Yep. Anyway, so that was just my little piece about <laughs> the background here. <laughs> so um, uh, on the options side, uh, the volumes are still pretty small. How are you going to increase the, um, the public interest in, in those options? Um, and what's, what are your clients' retail clients? Are they um, uh, are you so brokers? The volume, so from our perspective, it's really painful to say it's, uh, the volumes are small because we, we think they've been... <laughs> well, sorry, highest. relative to OKEX. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we, we celebrated yesterday uh, electronically, so to say, because right. I was here. But yesterday was a, not a volume record day. So yesterday was the biggest volume day ever globally in terms of options trading, so 200 million um, traded together with my neighbors. Um, so it's, it's, it's an extraordinary day, but in comparison to more mature markets, it's still small. Yeah. Um, but if you look at where we're coming from, so if you look at 2019, the last six months, we traded on average per month 120, 130,000 contracts, stable. Yep. Every month, a few thousand more or less, but it's stable. And then in January, we traded 180-something. And in February, we traded 280-something, so 100,000 contracts. So one uh, contract is one BTC, so 100,000 contracts uh, on top of the previous month. So extraordinary growth numbers. Well, that's um, because uh, the, va the value of any option will increase with volatility. It's volatility If there's driven. no volatility, no. then you might as well buy the future. No, it's, it's driven by two but things, in, volatility yes. um, and clients. Of course, you need so, to have the demand for uh, yeah. that volatility. So, yeah. so we've seen a lot of inflow of new uh, clients. So it's the same story. Well, this is showing saying. a real appetite for trading volatility, which is the sort of thing yeah. that you're trying to introduce. Because I mean, you can trade the underlying itself ad infinitum, but if the market's flat, there's no activity. Everybody's waiting for volatility. And of course, unfortunately, in options, there's only an indirect trade in volatility. Do you have many people taking straddles and volatility bets, or don't you know that, that sort of detail? We do know, so we look at the portfolios and we look at the active clients. So, so for example, to come back at your previous slide about the, uh, the, the, the BitMEX trade, though in order to get that position, so it was 70 million or something, yeah, yeah. Uh, you need to post a lot of margin as well. Yeah, you so those do. are the big guys. Yeah, yeah, they're the whales. All of us we'll know these people. Next, yeah. So it's, uh, KYC is one thing, but you, you're in touch with your active mm -hmm. clients on a daily basis. So you know what they're doing, you know what they're looking for, you know the problems in your market, you know uh, what they like. Um, so you, you were looking at, for example, liquidity in the far uh, out of the monies, etc. Yes, this one on the, the right there. So the put call ratio has gone right down to 0.2 at some point. It's a fifth so it's of the volume in deep out, um, more than 10% away from them at the money in put. Yeah, so, so we look at that stuff and ask them, uh, yeah. so what do we need to do? Is there whatever is the problem? So part of it is simply market makers. Uh, so as the, the market is maturing, yeah. so we see a lot of people here interested in trading options, um, but you need someone to sell them as well. So yeah. um, the market maker space is still limited. So we are, we're getting more and more market makers, but in order to be a proper market maker in crypto, which is relatively new, um, there's not a lot of software available, and there's not a lot of knowledge available. So all the, the prop firms out there, they're looking for options traders. There's simply not a lot of them available. So not yet. It's, mm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but that's slowly coming. So we yeah. get more and more market makers in. Then they start quoting uh, the, the high volume stuff. The, the problem with with the um, options market makers is that hedging. Um, you know, if you use something like a Black Scholes model, it's probably not going to give you a very good hedge. And that's where the market makers they obviously do a premium above their hedging costs. And we need to have proper stochastic processes. We probably need something like a, a Heston or a, a Garch with, with a jump in volatility and maybe a stochastic long-term vol of vol, which is going to give you the proper sort of hedge ratios. Or, in fact, this is what um, we're, we're working on, regime-dependent um, uh, hedges. So once, these, um, once the academic research is available there, then you should have plenty of market makers being able to, to hedge their positions, and they'll come in. Anyway, next subject is whales. And here is a picture of a whale, a humpback, as I call it, as opposed to a killer pack. This is one particular large whale transaction that amounted to, a, um, a, for me, a humpback is something in excess of 1 billion USD. And we've seen three of these in the last month. Um, this is one originating in Huobi addresses and going through to um, this uh, wallet here. 
um, and some of them get broken up. You get identify, unidentified wall wallets um, doing coordinated attacks on uh, Binance, OKEx, Huobi, wherever, wherever you like. So my question on whales is, do you, ha um, and again, it'll have to be Lennox is the only person who's susceptible <laughs> to this type of whale. Do you have any whale watching programs as well? Do you have any onboarding well, we, we, or offboarding yeah. of yeah. very, very large transactions, um, like this Huobi offboarding? Yeah, I don't want to comment for you, but uh, we we do have a, we do have a, what we call the warning tracking system. Okay. Uh, for a unusually large amounts. Pardon. Deposit, like abnormal amounts of deposit. Yes. And withdrawal on OKX alone. So if you do want to unusually uh, withdraw a large amount of token in BTC value, it, it, it will trigger an internal trigger. warning system. Mm -hmm that you need to do a video revocations on the identity. So you actually call them up if... if yeah, yeah, we will block the right. withdrawal. So it's pretty difficult okay. if you really want to have a whale that transfer in and out on OKEX alone. First, you need a KYC, and you need to have a lot of roadblock, you need obstacle, you need to clean up. So, uh, so, so it's lucky. Uh, somehow we got a lot of complaints of these three field procedures, but somehow it's lucky that we don't receive a lot of uh, illicit funding. So you're not you're not often having to. I mean, no. you're not looking at contra bets that, for example, at the no. moment there could be some pretty large um, uh, manipulative uh, trades or real trades, just you know pushing down the price of Bitcoin because it's safe haven, or could be other reasons. I mean, you were saying earlier that you that you think that what's happening now in in the Bitcoin prices? Um. Uh, yeah, so, so some people think it's like conspiracies or uh, whatever <laughs> the reason might be. Um, but talking to clients, it's just risk off. Uh, people sell risky assets, equities and uh, crypto the like. So crypto is not the gold, uh, the, the safe, uh, safe, haven. safe haven people were hoping for or um, were expecting it to be. Uh, it's not. It's a risky asset and people selling it if it moves 10%. Yeah, I agree okay. with uh, the risk off. Methodology. So it's not comparison as Bitcoin. Bitcoin can only be a safe haven for a certain threshold, I think. Yeah. So if you, if it's a diversifier rather than. Yeah, it's diversifying in certain level, then afterwards, you still want to risk okay. off and, and cash is king. Better. Okay, now, um, Andy, we haven't said very much, but in developments, like uh, your boutique operation, this is um, a picture of um, what we call the VXBT, it's a VIX index for, for Bitcoin. Um, we actually think it's probably better to do it less than 30 days because of the, 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 the speed of Bitcoin markets. But this looks at like a curve of, of a, a VIX type index mm -hmm. um, till the 1st of March. More recently, the very short end, as you've seen from the implied vol, is, is jumping up to about 70%. But the highest peak of the seven day index was 140% in last summer. Anyway. So to your volatility products, I was very interested to see that you are offering products based on this type of index. Is that correct? Um, so I, are you referring to the move contracts that we offer, which are like the one day forward straddles or? Sorry, could you, what sort of Are you of referring contract? to the move products that we have? Move products. Yes, yeah, so the name is products called move, right? Okay, yeah, can you move. explain them? Yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's effectively a package straddle. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for instance, every day there is a move contract for the next day which expires to the one hour VWAP, absolute okay. value between the first hour and the 24th hour of the next day. Of, of what? VWAP of what? VWAP of the Bitcoin price. Of the Bitcoin price? Yeah, so it's a one day forward Bitcoin, Bitcoin straddle. Okay, so that's not a volatility. Not a volatility product. Well, if it's sort of in, in, a, in a way, but it really is just an option straddle. It's just a very, it's an overnight option, but it's a VWAP settlement yep. price. It's so, packaged I mean, into, you know. Okay, so we all have a settlement price. I mean. The BTC um, that you use is just a, a, an equally weighted average for the settlement of your options, yeah? Um, you use um, a medium weighted average or a volume VWAP. Uh, of, so anyway, the BRR is a medium yeah. weighted. In so, so basically, that's just an overnight contract. I'm sorry, it's just that we didn't have a chance to talk. <laughs> no, no, it's okay, things. yeah. I and I was just talking to the guy at your desk and I thought, oh, volatility products, great. So what can you tell me about volatility products? So, I mean, right now, Volatility products are something that everyone obviously wants to be able to trade. FTX doesn't actually have any direct volatility products that are open right now. Uh -huh. um, it is something that we've been in development on, but we want to make sure we do it correctly. 
Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, hedging these things when you've got a put call ratio like that, <laughs> it's a static hedge, but it's it not going to yeah. work if you haven't got the liquidity. Um, I imagine we'll probably have something similar to that out in the next like six months. Um, okay. Some sort of live volatility product. But what we've been exploring is giving traders a way to express a volatility type uh, interest. So that would be like the move product that I was that yeah. I was expressing, or um, we do have an options market open right now. Um, but we're just waiting on kind of the maturity of the market and, and yeah, kind of testing, testing the interest. waters to make sure yeah. that whatever we release makes sense. Okay, jolly good. Now we have time, eight minutes for, I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. For FTX, <coughs> how does FTX solve the conflict of interest issue? Conflict of interest, I don't know what conflict of interest there is, but anyway, given that their trading arm, ah, Almeida Research, is doing market making there. So. Yep. Your, your trading arm is also your market maker? Your, your, so, your yeah, own market uh, maker, our is CEO, Sam, is the uh, founder of Alameda Research, which incubated FTX. Okay. Now, Alameda Research is a quant trading firm uh -huh. and a market maker on a lot of platforms. You know, most Not just familiar. your platform. They Not just our platform, no. Um, are they one of your main, mar are they your only market maker? Uh, the, on day one, they were basically our only market maker. Um, we've been growing out the liquidity providing uh, from other people over the last year. Uh -huh. uh, we knew that it was going to be optically difficult, um, but we figured it solved the chicken of the egg problem of how do you get a, how do you get an exchange to have liquidity? Well, you have to have market makers, okay. and no market makers want to trade on an exchange with no volume. Um, so we decided. How many market just, makers do you have now? Oh, we have dozens now. Okay. Um, which has been great. I mean, it's been a lot of like what we've been trying to you know find find more makers, and and that's sort of what you've seen in our you know growth volume. So the spreads have come right down, and uh, yeah, yeah. it's pretty competitive there. Oh yeah, now it's quite competitive. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's something that we decided that we were going to be pretty public about from day one, and not try to hide. Um, you know, we show our faces, we we tell people about it, and you know, it's just incentivized for both Alameda and FTX for for the program for the platform to be you know successful. That okay. it's healthy and and positive. So. Jolly good. Yep. Okay. Next one. Do you officially or unofficially sell co co-location, co allowing select traders a higher speed of access to the order book? Let's repeat that. Do you officially or unofficially sell co-location, allowing select traders a higher speed of access to the order book? Okay. So we're talking about the sort of fiber optic cables and vacuums that exist now with the CME, and they. Obviously, they charge um, their, their clients for this, you know, uh, five-second advantage to, to front run. Is anybody involved in that? We do. Um, so okay. our infrastructure is in Strasbourg at the moment, and we're moving to London uh, this month. So okay. to L Equinix LD4, which is um, uh, close by. Um, what we have there is one rack, which is our equipment, uh, so simply our servers, and then two racks for clients, where we host up to two client servers max. So if you want the full rack of your own, you have to do it yourself. If you are a small outfit and you can't afford the full rack, we can host one or two servers on behalf of the client. So How much do you charge? We charge 250 pounds a month per server. That's not bad. Which is extremely it's cheap. Nothing. <laughs> it includes internet, energy, uh, oh, the hosting, wow. everything. So, uh, and this is definitely uh, CME would charge like 10,000 euros or whatever. But it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's at cost or it's possibly including installation loss making. Uh, only to stimulate trading, uh, but we're, it's not. It, yes, it's it's it. a bit phrased as if, if as if we're hiding something about it. It's just on our website, and everyone's free to approach us. So absolutely, it's, that's the way to, to. So we have uh, yeah. a little bit less than I think f something like 40 firms uh, doing this at the moment. Excellent. But it's not live yet, so it's to be launched in March. So the servers are there, um, but the matching is not done there yet. Good. And what about Andy and Lennox? Are either of you doing that? Uh, so we are we're hosted entirely out of on the cloud, so we don't really have a physical box colo or bare metal or anything like that. Um, probably within a year, we imagine we'll have something like that available. Yeah, because okay. um, FTX is is relatively new. Compared yeah, to the, like okay, yeah, it's all it's it's about a year old in mm. a few weeks. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, you're um, yeah. So I, I don't strides. think we'll have any. Um, mm. I don't think we'll have anything ready for about a year. And and what about? Uh, yeah, we FTX? we are also in cloud, but so uh, we provide. Uh, a simulation of collocation service mm -hmm. for for designated traders. So uh, so basically, we build a cross connect uh, with AWS and Alibaba Cloud uh, service provider. So basically, if you have machine a virtual machine in Alibaba or AWS, 
OKX matching engine can provide cross-connect service to directly to your matching en to, to your service. To your, to your, so it looks like a collocation, uh, but it's cross-connect by the cloud provider. So you will have a relatively speed advantage of that uh, and a better throttle rates. Uh, so in return, we don't charge anything. Uh, in return, uh, we only open to this spot for designated market makers on OKEX. So you have uh, market making obligations if you want this particular box. No. Right. OK. Um, let's take another question. Could you guys talk about a potential derivative market where block space on BT... Oh, gone. OK. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't finish that one. Insurance against being hacked, that's not particular on derivative exchanges. Um, I mean, I was talking about your insurance fund earlier. You have this big insurance fund for margin calls. It doesn't operate in the normal way. I guess it's the same with you, Andy, that instead of having a broker, you, uh, you have an insurance fund. So as soon as somebody can't make a market margin call, you liquidate their position, mm -hmm. and then you use the insurance fund if you can't find a counterparty. Though that's quite interesting, novel insurance. But uh, yeah, this is, yeah, it's... it's, it's uh, um, being hacked is uh, is for all exchanges, not particularly for yours. Oh yeah, there's where we are. Where block space on BT would become actively traded, and um, would, will there be derivative market for fees? Wow, that's a bit of a left field question. Anybody want to take that potential derivative market where block space on BTC would be actively traded? <laughs> uh, uh, we get questions, especially about options, about uh, why don't you launch whatever, Ripple options, all this stuff. Uh, yeah, very uh, I think this stuff, yeah. It's, not really it's simply major. too small. That's, that's my answer. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. There's a lots of interesting products out there, but this is simply too small. Yeah. But not yet, at least uh, for us. Yeah. I mean, I you're more boutique. Yet. Would you be doing something yeah, like that? Yeah, it sounds like something that people ask us to do pretty often. Um, you know, difficulty features, hash rate, things like that. Um, they they sound interesting, but it, it it does beg the question like how do you is it all is it only going to be a one sided market for some of these things and uh, does that just potentially just create like a toxic product in some way? Um, it's more like the GSR type products. I mean, they were looking at things like um, difficulty swaps yeah. and, yeah. you know, so they're much more on-chain related. They're also trading their variant swaps on-chain. I imagine if, so if there's enough people that want to trade it, it'd be something we'd be interested in. But uh, right now, yeah. it's just more of a amusing from a lot of people. And okay. often the bilateral trade is different as well. So if you and me engage in a trade, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For a product quoted on any of our platforms, it requires someone to quote 24 hours, seven days a week. Yeah, of course. For one trade. Yeah, yeah. And market makers wouldn't be making any money. Yeah. Let's be playing video games the rest of the time. <laughs> okay, um, so the FCA just issued a warning about BitMEX carrying out regulated activities without a UK license, did they? Whoa, well, I'm not surprised. What are your regulatory strategies? That's a good one. How about, Luke, start with your regulatory strategies. <laughs> um, so we used to be a Dutch company, uh, but since the 10th of February, we created a Panamanian uh, subsidiary where running the platform um, has moved to. So the Dutch entity owns R&D and IP, and it's run by a Panamanian entity. Um, the reason why we did this is uh, because of AMLD, so the Anti-Money Laundering Directive in Europe, which is interpreted differently in every country. The Dutch approach, which would have been applicable to us, was much more strict than the European approach, which is much more strict than the, uh, the global or the Asian approach, which would require us to ask our questions a much bigger KYC uh, stack of documents compared to our peers. Uh, which would simply mean that we would lose clients. So we, yeah. we, we moved to Panama. So we imposed KYC rules on our own, um, in specifically referring to this question. Uh, we don't offer anywhere. You never see us marketing. There's no branding. Uh, we don't send mails. Uh, yes, you've been quite under the radar for quite a yeah, while. No, so we, we, mm. people come to us, so that yeah. at least that we, what we try. But we don't try to actively engage, especially retail globally. Right. It's too risky. Okay, well, we're out of time and I have to go upstairs. So thank you very much to our panelists. Great.